All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, my name is Glauco Cesario. I graduated from the uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And uh, today I'm glad to be discussing a very interesting topic, probably one of the most interesting diseases uh, in neurology and in medicine. Now, let me go over the content of this lecture. I'm going to start with the case and then move over to the uh, introduction and epidemiology the pathophysiology of myasthenia gravis, its signs and symptoms, uh, the diagnosis, some differential diagnosis that we have to talk about, or have to think about, and then I'm going to end talking about treatment and some complications. So let me go ahead and um, read the case to you. So we have a 30-year-old woman. She comes to the office for difficulty eating. The patient refers that she has jaw weakness and extremely food for about a year now. She knows that the symptoms usually occur halfway through a meal, especially when chewing something difficult like a steak. The patient also reports that her vision becomes slightly blurred when driving home from work. Her husband also noticed she sometimes has a nasal speech and drooping of the eyelids at the end of the day. She has no symptoms in the morning. In past medical history, the patient has a history of hypothyroidism diagnosed three years ago and takes levothyroxine 25 micrograms daily. She has no known allergies. Uh, her father has a history of hypertension and diabetes, and her mother had breast cancer. The patient does not smoke or drink alcohol. Now, on physical exam, the patient appears tired, but in no acute stress. Blood pressure is 140 over 80, and the pulse is 80 beats per minute. Uh, on auscultation, the heart rate is regular with no murmurs, and lungs are clear to auscultation. The patient is awake, alert, and oriented. Uh, she has bilateral ptosis, which improves after a nice back is placed over her eyes for about two minutes. The motor function, she has strength four out of five in the proximal arm muscles and five out of five on distal arms and legs. Sensation is preserved. Reflexes are two out of four diffusely. There is no ataxia and Romberg sign is negative. The patient has some diagnostic tests done. And uh, she has a positive result for the acetylcholine receptor antibody. She also, she also has a CT scan of the chest, uh, which shows on the image here, a anterior mediastinal mass that was later confirmed to be a thymoma. She also has an electrodiagnostic test called repetitive nerve stimulation, which shows a decrementing response, which is uh, classically seen in myasthenia gravis. So of course, the phyto diagnosis here is myasthenia gravis. And um, I always think it's, it, it is uh, good to start with the case to give you the general clinical picture of the disease. Uh, and now give, let me give you some more information. So myasthenia gravis is a autoimmune neurological condition characterized by skeletal muscle weakness. And although this is the most common disorder of neuromuscular transmission, it remains relatively rare uh, with an annual incidence of 8 to 10 cases per million and a prevalence of 150 to 250 cases per million. When it comes to the age of onset, this disease shows a bimodal distribution. It has an early peak on the second and third decades of life with a female predominance and a late peak on the 60 to 80 decades of life with a male predominance. Now, as an autoimmune process, uh, we have evidence that this disease is associated with other autoimmune diseases uh, that I'm going to talk about later on. Now, one thing that is uh, central here and very important when, uh, when talking about myasthenia gravis is uh, understanding the disease pathophysiology. Now, like I said, this is a disease of neuromuscular transmission. So this, this here is a normal uh, neuromuscular junction. We have our presynaptic membrane on the top, our postsynaptic membrane or the muscle membrane on the bottom. And between those two, we have a space that we call the synaptic cleft. Now in a normal situation, what happens is when an action potential reaches the nerve terminal, that signals for the release of acetylcholine, the acetylcholine diffuses over through the synaptic cleft and binds to the receptors on the muscle membrane. Now, when that happens, those receptors lead to a cascade of events that eventually cause muscle contraction. There are also two 
other proteins here that are worth mentioning. Uh, one of those is the muscle specific kinase, and the other one is the lipoprotein receptor related protein four, which are transmembrane proteins that when activated by ligands, they cause the clustering of the acetylcholine receptors onto the membrane. So this is all the normal situation here. Now let's uh, look at acetylcholine in more detail. As I said, uh, when acetylcholine gets released into the synaptic cleft, one thing that is important to realize is it is rapidly broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. So this, it is important to know that enzyme because later on when we talk about treatment, we're gonna target that enzyme and, um, and see how that works. Now, let's see what happens uh, in myasthenia gravis. So here, we have the neuromuscular junction again. And as I said, this disease is autoimmune in etiology. So what happens is the B cells produce autoantibodies against some of those receptors that we just talked about. So for instance, here we have the uh, receptor against the acetylcholine receptor. We have the antibody against the acetylcholine receptor in red. And uh, when that antibody is present, it binds to the acetylcholine receptor and it blocks uh, the binding of acetylcholine present in the synaptic cleft. Uh, we also have uh, another mechanism, a second mechanism that these antibodies, they can activate complement producing the membrane attack complex, which damages uh, the postsynaptic membrane. And yet we have a third mechanism, which is when those receptors are bound by antibodies, there is an increase in receptor internalization and degradation. So we can see how that antibody uh, decreases the response and the signals that lead to muscle contraction, therefore causing uh, the muscle weakness that we see in myasthenia gravis. Now we can also have receptors against the muscle specific kinase and the lipoprotein protein four receptor, which, and we said that those transmembrane proteins work by clustering the acetylcholine receptors onto the membrane. So we can see that if we have those receptors present and we have inactivation of those proteins, we can see how we're gonna have reduced density of those receptors and therefore uh, less muscle contraction being generated. Now let's look at the signs and symptoms here. Um, so the hallmark of the disease is fluctuating skeletal muscle weakness that is usually worse later in the day or after exercise. And um, although myasthenia gravis can cause muscle weakness in any skeletal muscle, there are some uh, few presentations that are very characteristic of the disease. For instance, the disease can affect the eyelid muscles leading to drooping of the eyelids or ptosis. As we can see in the picture right here, this gentleman has ptosis on his right eyelid. And um, that can be unilateral or bilateral. Now, another group of muscles that can be, um, can be involved here are the extraocular muscles and that can cause double vision or diplopia. So, so that, that, diplopia, diplopia. that diplopia usually uh, corrects when the patient closes one of his eyes. And uh, early on the disease presentation, it can seem like blurry vision. So the patient may know that he's having blurry vision, which later on turns out to be uh, diplopia. Now, uh, the other group of muscles that can be involved are the jaw muscles. So the patient can have weakness when chewing food, uh, especially when chewing something that takes a lot of effort, like a steak or something like that. Um, the other muscles of the, the oropharyngeal muscles can be involved, causing dysarthria and dysphagia as well. Uh, that can also lead to a nasal speech that is usually present um, later on in the day. Facial weakness can happen and uh, the patient can lose some of his facial features. So the, um, the family members can 
notice that the patient has lost some of the facial features or lost his or her smile. Uh, neck muscles can be involved. And sometimes what happens is the weight of the patient's head overcomes the neck muscles and that leads to sort of a drop head syndrome. Limb muscles can be involved, uh, especially the proximal muscles of the arms and legs. Uh, and last, respiratory muscles can be involved, leading to a life-threatening situation uh, with respiratory failure that is called myasthenia, myasthenia, myasthenia crisis uh, that I'm going to talk about at the end of the lecture. Now, there are two main clinical forms of myasthenia. There's ocular myasthenia, where the symptoms are isolated to the eyelids and the extraocular muscles. And there's generalized myasthenia where we can have ocular symptoms, but we can also have some degree of bulbar symptoms, facial, neck, limb, and respiratory muscle weakness. Now, for the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, um, we rely heavily on typical history and clinical findings, of course, but we have a couple of bedside tests that can be helpful. Uh, for instance, we have the eye spec test that, it, that could be helpful in patients presenting with ptosis. So we have this gentleman right here presenting with ptosis on his left eyelid. And how we perform this test is we take an ice pack or bag full of ice and place it over the closed eyelid for two minutes. And then we assess for the resolution of the ptosis which is usually temporary. So this, this should be uh, an extension of the physical examination and it can help when thinking about myasthenia gravis. And uh, the reason behind that test is the physiological principle that neuromuscular transmission that we talked about improves uh, at lower temperatures. We also have, used to have a test called the Edrophonian or Tensilon test uh, this is no longer used. Uh, this is a drug actually that is no longer available in the US. Uh, this is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And remember we talked about that enzyme. That enzyme degrades the acetylcholine present in the synaptic cleft. So if we block that enzyme with hydrophonium, more acetylcholine is left to try to overcome the, uh, the antibodies at the postsynaptic membrane. Now, um, I like to think that this disease, uh, everything makes sense when talking about this disease because the pathophysiology relates to the signs and symptoms, but also relates to the serological test, the diagnostic, diagnostic test that we have. Um, it also relates to the kind of treatments that we can use. So for instance, those autoantibodies that we talked about in the pathophysiology can actually be measured as a diagnostic test to try to confirm myasthenia gravis, and they are quite specific. So we have the antibody against the acetylcholine receptor, which is present in about 85% of the patients and has a strong correlation with timing abnormalities. But we also have uh, the antibody against the uh, muscle-specific kinase, which is present in about 8% of the patients. And we can have, um, the antibody against the lipoprotein receptor related protein four, which is present in about 1% of the patients. And they are usually not associated with those thymic abnormalities that I'm going to mention in a minute. Now, we have some diagnostic tests, some uh, electrodiagnostic tests that can be quite useful. Um, the most widely available test would be the repetitive nerve stimulation. And, uh, the way that we perform this test is we place an, an, uh, an electrode on the end plate of the muscle, and then we stimulate the nerve uh, associated with that muscle. And then we can record the action potential uh, being measured at that muscle. So a normal response would be that the amplitude of the action potentials are the same with repetitive nerve stimulation. This would be a normal situation here. But in myasthenia gravis, we have a decrease of action potential with repetitive nerve stimulation, creating sort of a decrementing response. So this would be 
uh, defining innovation with myasthenia gravis, a decremental response. We also can have a more sophisticated test, which is called the single fiber electromyography. Again, this is more technically demanding than the repetitive nerve stimulation, but this one is very sensitive uh, for myasthenia gravis. And what we do here is we can uh, measure the action potential in two different muscles uh, associated with the same nerve, so innervated by the same motor neuron. And what we see is, uh, here's the normal situation. So the first muscle action potential being recorded and then the second one being recorded, uh, we can see that there is no variability in those two action potentials. But then uh, if there is any uh, disease decreasing the neuromuscular transmission, then we can have a variability of the second action potential in relation to the first. And that is called a jitter, an increased jitter. That would be present uh, in patients with myasthenia gravis. So we can see here how the second muscle action potential is variable comparing to the first one. Now, let's see some, um, some of the associated conditions here. So we talked about timing abnormalities. Uh, they are very famous in association with myasthenia gravis. In patients with thymic abnormalities, 85% of them have thymic hyperplasia and 15% have a kind of tumor that is called a thymoma. Now, uh, in this picture right here, we can see on the chest X-ray, we have a mass uh, kind of inseparable from the heart here. And then on lateral X-ray, we can see that that mass is actually on the anterior mediastinum. On the CT, we can see the mass which is about 12 centimeters and it is compressing on the uh, lateral wall of the right ventricle here. So that mass uh, was actually biopsied later and turns out to be a thymoma. Uh, as I said before, this is an autoimmune condition and um, there's evidence that this disease, myasthenia gravis, is associated with other autoimmune conditions such as autoimmune thyroid disorders, and autoimmune rheumatic disease, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis and Jogren syndrome. Now let's look at some of the um, differential diagnosis here. So we have uh, two lists for differential diagnosis. We have conditions that mimic ocular myasthenia, which are thyroid ophthalmopathy. Here we have a picture of a patient with proptosis or thyroid eye disease. Uh, we can also have something called uh, chronic progressive external ophthalmopathy, which is a mitochondrial disease. Myotonic dystrophy can mimic myasthenia gravis, and then brainstem and motor cranial nerve pathology. Now, there are some conditions that can mimic generalized myasthenia, such as ALS, uh, Leber Eaton myasthenic syndrome, and the Miller Fisher variant of Guillain Barre. Uh, but also, botulism. Uh, here in this picture, we can see a patient with botulism. We can see that he has bilateral ptosis. But if you look very closely, we can see that this patient has dilation of the pupils, which uh, would be a finding in botulism, but would not be something that we find in myasthenia gravis. Now, uh, let's discuss treatment now. Uh, let's go back to the pathophysiology here. We have the acetylcholine being released, being degraded by acetylcholine esterase. So remember that we can target that enzyme with something called the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And if we target that enzyme and block that enzyme, then more acetylcholine would be present in the synaptic cleft, trying to overcome the receptors that are bound by antibodies. All right? So we have. Uh, a type of acetylcholine esterase inhibitor that is called pyridostigmine, that is probably the first option on, when treating patients with mild to moderate myasthenia gravis. Uh, the response can be quite variable. Some people, some patients do very well with this medication and some people have little to no response. Now, for those patients who don't have a good response to the first line therapy, or in most patients who present with generalized disease, uh, they have, uh, they need to be treated with another type of medication that are the immunosuppressants. Uh, 
So uh, in my the graphics, usually we have, we can use glucocorticoids first initially because they work, they have a very short uh, rapid onset of action. But then in those patients that we worry about chronic side effects or we want to reduce the dosage of glucocorticoids, we also have uh, non-steroidal immunosuppressants such as azathioprine and microphenolate. And in the recent years, uh, we've been having a lot of studies and uh, promising results with biological agents, uh, such as equilizumab, which is a complement inhibitor. And remember, the complement plays a role in the disease pathology. And also rituximab, which inhibits uh, the B cells that produces the autoantibodies here. In some patients, we can think about the surgical treatment, the thymectomy. Um, of course, in patients with uh, thymoma, then uh, surgery is usually indicated when feasible. But also patients uh, that present without a thymoma are, are indicated to have the surgery if they had generalized disease. They are positive for the acetylcholine receptor antibody and they are age 18 to uh, 50. Now, to end my presentation, let me just uh, mention the the life-threatening condition that can happen in those patients when they have worsening of myasthenic weakness affecting the respiratory muscles, and that can cause respiratory failure requiring intubation. So this can happen spontaneously, but can also uh, happen because of a precipitant. We have a long list of precipitants. Um, most commonly is an infection but also pregnancy, surgery, or even sleep deprivation can precipitate myasthenic crisis. Uh, we also have a long list of medications that can precipitate myasthenic crisis. Uh, we have good evidence that antibi antibiotics can uh, precipitate this life-threatening condition, especially aminoglycosides, uh, fluoroquinolones, erythromycin, but also beta blockers and calcogenic blockers. So it is always, um, we always have to avoid those medications when dealing with patients with myasthenia gravis. Now, uh, for the treatment of myasthenic crisis, of course, we have to admit those patients to the ICU and monitor them for respiratory failure. If they present signs of respiratory failure, we have to perform the elective intubation, preferentially early in the disease to avoid further complication. And here we also have uh, evidence for the use of rapid acting treatments such as plasma exchange and intravenous immunoglobulin on top of high dose uh, glucocorticoids. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that was what I had to say about myasthenia gravis. Uh, I know that is a lot to cover in about 20, 25 minutes time, but I hope that was quite useful to everyone. And uh, I would be happy to open for questions or any comments from the team.